Welcome back, everyone, to the fourth and final part of our look at Warhawk's fantastic series on the campaign and battle of Shiloh. Uh, we have left off with uh, Buell's Army of the Ohio arriving uh, just in the nick of time as Grant's making a last-ditch defense up on Pittsburgh Landing. Now the Union is ready to counterattack on April 7th, 160 years ago today. This happened. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. And this is interesting. So it gives you a little bit of insight into at least how the Confederates are portraying this after day one. It's a complete victory. We've driven the enemy from every position. And that's not misleading. They did drive the enemy from almost every position. They didn't drive them off Pittsburgh Landing. And now they're about to get surprised with a counterattack. I have to think that Beauregard had to know that Buell's army had arrived because they were crossing the Tennessee River and there's no way the Confederates could not have seen this happening, even in darkness. So I think Beauregard's got to know what's coming. Uh, and hopefully he's at least somewhat thinking he's prepared for that and not completely caught off guard, uh, hopefully for his sake anyway. But we know what ends up happening. Before dawn on April 7, 1862, the combined armies of Major Generals Ulysses S. Grant and Don Carlos Buell began to edge slowly forward from Pittsburgh Landing in a massive counterattack. Major General Lew Wallace's 3rd Division of the Army of the Tennessee on Grant's extreme right flank and overlooking the broad valley of Tillman Branch leads off the combat with an artillery duel with Captain William H. Ketchum's Alabama Battery. So Lou Wallace, the day before, um, has kind of, I don't want to say got lost, but backtracked a few times and never gets into the fight. He's the one uh, division in Grant's army that hasn't really fought during this battle so far. And so Grant's like, all right, you're leading the attack, the counterattack on day two. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. And there aren't a lot of casualties. Like my ancestor, Sam Hughes, was in the 20th Ohio, which is in Whittlesey's uh, brigade, which is kind of back here. I think they lost one man at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, very few casualties happened for the Union on day two. Most of their casualties were in the first day. Part of Ruggles' 1st Division in Bragg's 2nd Corps, posted in a portion of McClernand's camp in North Jones Field across the ravine. Positioned to Lew Wallace's left are the remnants of Sherman's 5th Division, then McClernand's 1st, along with the remainder of W.H.L. Wallace's 2nd Division, now under Colonel James Tuttle, and Stephen Hurlbut's 4th Division, stretching into line eastward toward the landing. And so you'll notice here that you've now got Buell's army out front. So most of these Union units have been just shattered on day one. The Confederates are equally in pretty bad shape. They've had to attack most of the day. They've lost significant numbers of their men. And so put yourself in the mindset of a Confederate soldier. You've just fought for 10 hours. You've lost horrendous casualties. You've seen a great deal of victory, but you're exhausted. Uh, you've And not just from the day's fighting. Remember, they had been marching through some pretty terrible weather to get there to fight in the first place. So they're exhausted. They're broken. They're uh, just hanging on themselves, even though they, their morale's up because they've won a great victory on day one. Uh, early in the morning, they're going to get hit and just no time to rest at all after a long day the day before. Deployed forward of Grant's left are Buell's troops from the Army of the Ohio. The 4th Division of Brigadier General William Bull Nelson on the left, Brigadier General Thomas L. Crittenden's 5th Division in the center, and Brigadier General Alexander M. McCook's 2nd Division. So I want to talk a little bit about the McCooks, because being a Northeast Ohio guy, the McCooks are from Northeast Ohio. Uh, Carrollton, Ohio is where the, the McCook house is, which is like 40 minutes from my house. And um, They're known as the Fighting McCooks, and there's a reason for it. Let's take a look at this family. So the Fighting McCooks, 15 members of the McCook family fought uh, for the Union uh, during the war. Uh, there were two families. Uh, there was Dan McCook, 
Eight of his nine sons fought for the Union, and his brother John McCook and John's five sons. So the fathers and all the sons uh, became uh, members uh, of the, almost all of them were officers. Um, Daniel McCook, the patriarch of the tribe of Dan, lived in Carrollton, Ohio before the war. He got a commission as a major and lost his life at the Battle of Buffington Island, which was part of uh, Morgan's, John Hunt Morgan's raid, which actually came very near to Carrollton where it ended up. Um, they, they fought through Carroll County, ended up in um, Jefferson County, and then eventually in Columbiana County, which is the county to the south of the one I live in. Uh, his son was Brigadier General um, uh, and served as a t- Ohio Attorney General before the war, George. Uh, others member, members of Dan's family were Latimer, Robert, Alexander, who we just talked about, uh, was uh, ended up a Corps Commander in the Western Theater, Daniel Jr., uh, Edwin Stanton McCook, Edwin Stanton, Lincoln's um, Attorney General, uh, not Attorney General, he was an attorney before the war, uh, but he was the Secretary of War, was uh, from nearby Steubenville, Ohio, which is very close to Carrollton. Um, Then we've got uh, Charles Morris McCook and John James McCook. Latimer was a major. Confederate guerrillas murdered him while he lay wounded in the back of an ambulance in Tennessee. Robert became a brigadier general and died in Tennessee. Alexander was a major general, the one that we saw here at Shiloh. Edwin was also a major general. Uh, He survived the war, became governor of North Dakota Territory, was assassinated. Daniel McCook became a brigadier general, was killed at Kennesaw Mountain. Charles Morris was the first McCook killed in the war, dying from wounds at the First Battle of Bull Run. John James survived the war with the rank of colonel. So that's just a little bit of a glimpse at this incredible family that uh, not a lot of people know about, really. On the right, first moving Bull Nelson's troops across Dill Branch, Major General Buell finishes his initial battle deployments by advancing Crittenden and McCook inland on the Corinth Road. With his left flank anchored on the river, Buell's front extends westward for over a mile, where his right flank forms astride the Hamburg, Savannah, and Corinth Road Junction, one mile southwest of Pittsburgh Landing. In all, Grant has over 45,000 men in line, nearly half of them are in fresh units. The Confederates are so badly intermingled that little corps, division, or even in some cases brigade organization and cohesion exist. And this is again one of the problems that goes back to the first day of the battle is that uh, Johnston didn't really, if there's one big knock on Johnston, there's, there's no doubting the man's bravery uh, and his skill on the battlefield. Uh, but he didn't exercise real good organizational skills uh, in putting together this army and then in leading this army. Uh, it's a real hodgepodge, and you know men are overlapping, and you know attacks aren't well coordinated. And, and honestly, the Battle of Shiloh could have gone very differently if there had been better organization on the Confederate side. It takes two hours for aides first to locate and then mobilize General Polk and his command, which had unfortunately retired the previous night to a point well south of the rest of the army, four miles inland from the river. Therefore, as Beauregard hastily sets about locating and then deploying his scattered troops, only General Breckinridge would manage to form all three brigades of his corps side by side in line of battle. Meanwhile, Generals Hardy, Bragg, and Polk each again lead groups of commingled commands on different sectors of the broad three-mile front. By 10 a.m., General Beauregard has established a stable front, which runs across the field from southeast to northwest, about a mile and a half inland from the river. Hardy, with his forces formed along the Hamburg Purdy Road, directs operations on the right. Something I should mention, too, that as we're looking at all these kind of maps and looking at where the units are and everything like that, remember, there are... 10,000 or more casualties from the first day's battle and they're everywhere and you know this is one of those battles where we have multiple descriptions from different officers talking about how thickly 
the dead and wounded lie in certain areas uh, because the fighting was so intense and goes on for so long over the same ground. You know, Grant and others, and McClernand was one, I think we saw his quote earlier, uh, who described how you could walk from one end of some of these fields to the other, just stepping on bodies and never having to touch the ground. That's how closely they are. And now all these men are going to have to fight over the same ground. Where he meets Buell's advance on the river road. On Hardy's left comes Breckenridge, where the southern front angles northward from the eastern Corinth and Hamburg Purdy Road Junction. Breckenridge's corps holds the Confederate center along the Old Hornet's Nest front. Further north, Bragg assumes command of the far left flank, anchoring the southern front on the bluffs overlooking Owl Creek. Once General Polk returns to the field from the rear, he assumes command of the left center between Breckenridge and Bragg on his left. See what I mean? I mean, this is just like, okay, you're here. Uh, you take this area right here. I mean, there's... There's no real solid command structure that's happening. It's just kind of thrown together. Front, Beauregard manages to deploy some 28,000 men. All of whom have already fought. The sheer power of the Federal Thrust jolts the unsuspecting Southerners. A member of the Crescent Louisiana Regiment of New Orleans later noted, They appeared to me like ants in their nest, for the more we fired upon them, the more they swarmed about. One would have said that they sprouted from the ground like mushrooms. For the first time, Mississippi Private A. H. Mecklin recorded in his diary, I began to have doubts as to the issues of this contest. I knew that the enemy were reinforced and stoutly. Speaking of diaries, and uh, diary is one of the main tools I'm using to write my book on the 20th Ohio, which was at the Battle of Shiloh, because uh, there was a young man named Osborne Oldroyd who uh, kept a diary during the Vicksburg campaign. And it's an incredible resource for getting into the mind of a soldier and to seeing the daily life of what was going on. Uh, but there's a, a website I want to show you, and I'm going to put a link in the description uh, to this website. But check this out. This is really, really cool. So the website is, I don't even probably have to put the link. I can just tell you it's civilwardigital.com. And they've got all of these digital resources on here. The official records uh, are on here uh, and searchable, which is incredible. The official records are all of the dispatches, all of the reports that were given. You know, uh, uh, all of Grant's uh, commanders who gave official reports about what happened at the Battle of Shiloh, those are in the official records. They were published after the war, and a lot of libraries have these. They're just dozens of volumes that hold all this stuff. Um, but the Civil War diaries, I, diaries are so cool and they give you an insight you don't get anywhere else. And uh, I used some diaries when I was doing my research for my World War I trip because uh, there's just incredible stuff in there. And, and here you can see uh, just all of these diaries that are listed in order of um, their, by first name. Uh, they're organized and they're, they're literally, I think there's 1,600 of them on this website. Uh, these diaries that you can uh, access and some of them are long some of them are short but um, just amazing and they're almost all pdf files uh, you could just go diving into this stuff and just this one's 165 megabytes um, so it gives you a little bit of a sense of just what you're dealing with here but check it out civilwardigital.com you could just fall into a rabbit hole for days looking through all that stuff it's really cool Observed Private Thomas C. Robertson of the 4th Louisiana. At daybreak, our pickets came rushing in under a murderous fire, and the first thing we knew, we were almost surrounded by six or seven regiments of Yankees. Bull Nelson's division leads the advance on the Federal left south along the Hamburg Savannah Road. No serious opposition is encountered until his troops arrive at the Widow Wickers Field after 8 a.m. Suddenly, Colonel William B. Hazen's 19th Brigade is fired on by General Chalmers' troops who were moved up from their bivouac in Colonel Stewart's captured camps. Chalmers, joined by several other southern detachments, blocks Nelson's further advance along the road. Heavy skirmishing continues for the next hour and a half as both sides await reinforcements. 
Crittenden's and McCook's divisions, which moved southwest and west into the Hornet's Nest thicket astride the eastern Corinth and Corinth roads, follow Nelson's advance. Now see how well this this advance is happening. They're all moving forward together. You've got this nice long line of infantry, multiple brigades, three different divisions, um, and they're moving as one. And that's what you need when you're trying to make this mass attack like this. By 10 a.m., troops from both divisions are heavily engaged. Lou Wallace's division on the right had opened the day's fighting by sparring with Colonel Preston Pond's brigade in Jones Field. Pond is soon ordered to move his men to the opposite flank in the fight against Buell. And understand that this is happening at the same time as the stuff we just saw, because uh, what we just saw was up to about 10 o'clock. So look at the, the clock here. You know, this is about 10 o'clock when this advance has happened. So if you're wondering why are these guys so far out in front, why is, why is Lou Wallace behind? Well, that's why, because uh, this was happening at the same time as that other advance by sparring with Colonel Preston Pond's brigade in Jones Field. Pond is soon ordered to move his men to the opposite flank in the fight against Buell. This movement allows Wallace to advance his division across Tillman Branch into the north end of Jones Field. In front of Wallace, Sam Woods and Randall Gibson's Confederate brigades are hurriedly thrown forward to contest further Union advance south through Jones Field. As on the federal left, the Union advance here stalls, Wallace is forced to wait out Grant's promised support from Sherman and McClernand on his left. And now, if you're, if you're asking yourself the question, as I have, uh, why are some of these unit colors different? Like, why do you have a blue unit over on the Confederate side? Why do we have a gray one uh, on the Union side? I'm going to guess that in their research, they figured out that these units had different uniform colors. Uh, and that was a case, especially on the Confederate side, but even on the Union side, especially early in the war. Like at the first battle of Bull Run, Bull Run, you had all kinds of different uniforms. You had units showing up with Revolutionary War uniforms on. Uh, not from the Revolutionary War, but that style. Um, you have Zouaves in bright red. You've got Confederate units in blue. You've got Union units in gray. Uh, so there's a lot of that thing going on. As those troops had not yet advanced over Tillman Branch. About 9 to 9.30, General Ruggles brashly orders both Wood and Gibson to counterattack Wallace's division. The rebels are driven back by the fire of Morgan L. Smith's and John M. Thayer's brigades, along with five guns of Thurber's Battery I, 1st Missouri Light Artillery, which supports Wallace's hold on Jones Field. Buell, meanwhile, begins to make headway on the left. After 10 a.m., his divisions advance to the Sarabelle Peach Orchard, the site of such heavy fighting the previous day. Here, they encounter a reinforced Confederate line under Hardy along the Hamburg Purdy Road. Colonel Sanders L. Bruce's 22nd Brigade of Nelson's division attacks south across the Sarabelle field but is driven back by musketry in a heavy right flank infilade crossfire from Hodgson's 5th Company, Washington, Louisiana Artillery, and McClung's Tennessee Battery, both positioned to the west and Daniel Davis's wheat field. General Hardy orders a counterattack, which is spearheaded by Bowen's brigade in Breckinridge's Corps, now commanded by Colonel John S. Martin. However, they in turn are swept back to the Hamburg Purdy Road by the advance of Colonel Hazen's brigade. Hazen's Indiana and Ohio troops, joined by Colonel William Suey Smith's 14th Brigade of Crittenden's division on the right, surges southwest into Davis's wheat field, where they overrun part of Captain Hodgson's Washington artillery. The Crescent Louisiana Regiment, along with the 19th Louisiana, rushes forward to assist the hard-pressed cannoneers. In a frantic melee of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the Louisianans retake the battery. With heavy Confederate pressure on both flanks, Nelson's entire division is forced to retire to Wicker Field and regroup. Breckinridge's men have held firm on Hardy's left. Therefore, Crittenden, like Nelson, is forced to retire Smith's brigade back into the Hornet's Nest thicket where he busies himself reforming his lines within the thicket. 
As midday approaches, the fighting along the Confederate right seesaws back and forth. Before so here's the deal for the Confederates. They're good. They're going to be good for a short time. Uh, you know, they've been bloodied and fought for a long time the day before. They're they're going on adrenaline right now. Okay, they've won a big victory the first day. They've sent the Union reeling. And so for a while, they're going to keep up with things, but they're facing fresh troops. They're going to be overwhelmed with numbers. They're outnumbered almost two to one on the battlefield at this point. Not in this part of the field, but if you encounter all of the Union Army, you're outnumbered two to one. And they're only going to be able to hang on for so long. For noon, General Crittenden again attacks Breckenridge's front as his left presses down the eastern Corinth Road. Crittenden's right, along with McCook's division to the right, advances west across Duncan Field. This drive captures southern cannon and breaks the back of Breckenridge's resistance at Duncan Field. Having lost a large number of men, Breckenridge's corps retires from the fighting toward the southwest. And one of the things that's, I wouldn't say completely unique to the western theater, but much more common in the western theater than it is in the east, is uh, men from the same state fighting against each other. Occasionally you'll have Maryland against Maryland, for example, uh, in the Eastern Theater, but it's pretty rare. Uh, you got a couple of West Virginia units out there that are fighting against Virginia, stuff like that. But here, you've got a lot of Kentucky units going face to face. In fact, there was a battle in Eastern Kentucky uh, in 1862, uh, a small battle that was fought between two Kentucky units. And I had ancestors in each of those units fighting against each other who were neighbors to each other, fighting against each other. From noon until 2 p.m., the Northerners gained the upper hand astride the Eastern Corinth Road, where Crittenden, reinforced by detachments from Grant's army, advances south to the junction with the Hamburg Purdy Road. Meanwhile, General McCook presses west along the Corinth Road toward Water Oaks Pond and Wolf Field. On Buell's left, Nelson has also been reinforced with small detachments from Grant's army. Once again, Nelson's division enters Sarabell's field and attacks south toward the junction of the Hamburg Savannah and Hamburg Purdy Roads. By 2 p.m., Nelson's men have pushed Hardy's front southward into Prentice's camp and seized the Hamburg Purdy Road. This time, Nelson's men are here to stay. This is the general area of the uh, hornet's nest fighting. This area over two days has seen just intense hours and hours of close quarters fighting. Uh, there just there had to have been dead everywhere in this part of the field. This has got to be one of the bloodiest spots in all of North America, just for all the fighting that took place there over those two days. Since mid-morning, fierce fighting has raged on the Union right, where Confederate forces under Bragg and Polk fight unsuccessfully to halt the advance of Sherman, McClernand, and Hurlbut across Tillman Branch. By 11 a.m., the southern left was retiring south from Jones Field under the mounting pressure from Grant's army. From his headquarters at Shiloh Church, Beauregard works frantically to form a new line north of Water Oaks Pond. Beginning at noon, some of the heaviest fighting of the day occurs in this sector. With Hardy starting to give way on the right, most of the southern resistance is located west of the Eastern Corinth Road, in a line extending west along the Hamburg Purdy Road to Here Owl comes Creek. Lou Wallace finally. Just after noon, Brigadier General Lovell Rousseau's brigade, joined by the brigades of Colonel Edward Kirk and William Gibson, all from McCook's division attack westward through Wolf Field, astride the Corinth Road. And you've got Sherman coming back. And remember, this is where Sherman's division defended, was the area around Shiloh Church. And now his men are going to go right back into combat in that same area. Meanwhile, further west, Lew Wallace and Sherman continue to apply pressure on the southern left flank. As the Federals sweep forward through the center of McClernand's recaptured camps, Beauregard commits his remaining reserve Preston Pond's brigade. Pond arrives at Shiloh Church with only two regiments, 
but several other disorganized detachments are pieced together to form a conglomerate attack force. Colonel Robert Russell stated that the assault was led by General Beauregard, who bore the colors in front of the line under the fire of the enemy. I mean, you're risking losing a second army commander in as many days. Uh, Johnston was the only four-star general who died during the entire uh, American Civil War. There uh, were a couple of lieutenant generals on the Confederate side who died. A few army, er, there was one army commander on the Union side during the war, and that was General McPherson. Uh, who was killed at Atlanta, uh, but he was a major general because that was as high as anybody went except for Grant on the Union side. Several times during the day, Beauregard exposes himself to great harm by leading units into battle, scolded by his aides, who argue that he is unnecessarily endangering himself. Yep. The army commander bluntly fires back. The order must now be follow, not go. And this is, again, I think Beauregard is underrated as a Civil War general. I think... Uh, Time and time again, he's there. And, you know, I I can't think of any times where he just blows you away with just incredible tactics and brilliance on the battlefield, but he's solid. He's very rarely going to make really, really bad decisions. Uh, everybody makes some. But I think Beauregard, by and large, is a, is a solid general for the Confederates. And, you know, this is the kind of thing where he's like, no, I'm going to lead from the front. I'm going to inspire my men. You know, maybe this is reckless. It probably is because at that rank, you need to be thinking uh, about such things. But Unfortunately, Colonel Jacob Thompson of General Beauregard's staff noted, the fire and animation had left our troops. They were wiped out. Many Southern soldiers are disconsolate and refuse to respond to further pleadings by their officers. Beauregard observes the change in morale, and as the bitter contest wears on, he increasingly attempts to rally his soldiers in person. Now this is kind of a, a unique thing that it rarely happened on a battlefield. Union, 5th Kentucky, Confederate, 5th Kentucky. Uh, and I only knew about this because I had an ancestor uh, who was in the Confederate 5th Kentucky. Um, and uh, just, you don't see that very often on a battlefield. A last-ditch Confederate counterattack proves momentarily successful. Southerners surge back across Water Oaks Pond and enter the southern portion of McClernand's camp, forcing McCook's men to give ground. Riding up to Colonel James Veitch's brigade of General Hurlbut's division, which stands in support of McCook, General Grant personally orders Veitch forward to stabilize the faltering Union front. Moving steadily forward, Veitch's men advance across Review Field, past McCook's left, and strike the Confederate right flank. Caught within the Federal vise, Colonel Russell remembered that despite the courage displayed by Beauregard, human endurance could stand yeah. no longer against such odds, and our forces were compelled to fall back to the church. It was now evident to a troubled Beauregard that the Federals had received heavy reinforcements and his exhausted Confederates would be unable to prevail. Colonel Thomas Jordan inquires of the General, would it not be judicious to get away with what we have? Yeah. The Louisiana General replies, I intend to withdraw in a few moments. About 3 p.m. on the ridge across a valley of Shiloh Branch, south of Shiloh Church, a Confederate rearguard of some 5,000 men from Breckenridge's Corps, mixed detachments, and about a dozen guns is formed. This line holds the Federals at bay on the Corinth Road until 5 p.m., while the Southerners conduct an orderly withdrawal. At 5 p.m. on April 7, 1862, the bloody two-day Battle of Shiloh, or Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, finally comes to its end with the retreat of the final Confederate regiments from the battlefield. Grant and Buell have successfully recaptured all the ground lost the previous day thus concluding the bloody engagement in a decisive victory for the Union. The Battle of Shiloh is a major turning point in this early phase of the American Civil War. The body count proves to both North and South just what the cost of total war will be, and also demonstrates the changes in tactics and strategy with the advent of industrial warfare. Another smaller skirmish erupts the following day, April 8th, between elements of Major General Sherman's 5th Division conducting a reconnaissance in force against Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest's cavalry detachment 
at Fallen Timbers. And they call it Fallen Timbers because there were a bunch of, of trees that were down in that area. And um, yeah, uh, and this is the moment I believe that Grant says he, he recognizes that this is going to be a long war. When he sees just how fiercely the Confederates fight and how many casualties there are, this is when he accepts it's going to be a long war. Sherman already knew that, and Sherman was accused of being nuts because he was saying it loudly that this was going to be a long, bloody war. Uh, but now everybody else is starting to get it. But there's a real opportunity that gets missed here, and it's missed by Halleck because Halleck comes and takes command uh, of these forces uh, in the field. Uh, it's kind of the last time he'll lead troops in the field. And he leads this massive army to Corinth. And they've got this really big opportunity where Grant says later that, man, they could have taken Corinth. They could have marched down and gotten Vicksburg. And they could have advanced the war effort a year or more. Uh, but they're slow. And Halleck waits. And by the time Grant finally gets command, the Confederates have had time to reorganize. And, and, and they, they pull out of Corinth because they know they can't hold it. And they start to defend Mississippi. Grant had sent Sherman south down the Corinth Road to confirm whether the Army of Mississippi was in fact retreating or rallying for another day of fighting. Six miles south of Pittsburgh Landing, Sherman's men are defeated in a brief, sharp skirmish with forces charging cavalrymen. However, this clash is but a rearguard action by force protecting the retreat of the Army of Mississippi back towards Corinth. Now you see in this image Forrest grabbing a Union soldier. I don't. I knew this happened. I couldn't remember when it happened, but let me see if I can pull up the exact story of what happened when he pulls this soldier up on his horse. So here you go. Here it says um, during the rear guard in the Battle of Fallen Timbers, he drove through the Union skirmish line, not realizing the rest of his men had halted their charge when reaching the full Union brigade. Forrest charged the brigade single-handedly soon found himself surrounded. He emptied his Colt Army revolvers into the swirling mass of Union soldiers and pulled out his saber, hacking and slashing. A Union infantryman fired a musket ball into Forrest's spine with a point-blank musket shot, nearly knocking him out of the saddle. Forrest grabbed an unsuspecting Union soldier, hauled him onto his horse to use as a shield, dumped the man once he had broken clear and was out of range, then galloped back to his incredulous troopers. A surgeon removed the musket ball a week later without anesthesia, which was unavailable. Um, so Nathan Bedford Forrest, and we're not going to get into his whole biography, and there's a lot to talk about, about there, excuse me, but he starts as a private. He enlists as a private. But Forrest was a wealthy guy, a really wealthy guy. Uh, and he ends up using that wealth to form his own unit. And ends up rising all the way to lieutenant general. Uh, it's the single greatest rise of any one soldier during the course of the war. Butcher's Bill at Shiloh sends shockwaves through the divided nation. The casualties are staggering. The Union has lost 13,047 men, including 1,754 killed, 8,408 wounded, and 2,885 captured or missing. The Confederates have lost 10,699 men, including 1,728 killed, 8,012 wounded, and 959 captured or missing. It is the bloodiest battle of both the Civil War and American history up to this point. In fact, more casualties have been sustained at Shiloh than the total losses of the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, and Mexican-American War combined. I almost In said that the other day in one of the videos, but I wasn't 100% sure if that was true. I thought I remembered reading that, that Shiloh's casualties were more more than the battle casualties. Listen, you know, for example, on, uh, in the Revolutionary War, the vast majority of the deaths in the Revolution were not on the battlefield. Uh, most of the men who died in the Revolution died after being prisoners, uh, died on the prison ships, died at the Sugar House prison in New York City. There were tens of thousands of men who died as prisoners. Not nearly that many died uh, on the battlefield. 
so more casualties at Shiloh than had been killed in those other wars, not casualties. Uh, so it's a little misleading because people always talk about that name casualties. Casualties just means killed, wounded, missing, captured. It doesn't mean dead. Um, so more casualties at Shiloh than dead in all those other wars, I think is probably accurate. In the North, newspapers and the press are quick to focus the blame of the battle on Major General Ulysses S. Grant, the man who, just two months prior, had been praised as a hero for his victories at Forts Henry and Donelson. The fickle media, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was praised as a hero in the West for Fort Donaldson. People are sending him cigars, which will end up killing him because he dies of throat cancer later because they saw an image of him with a cigar and so everybody started sending them to him. Um, but then he has this victory, but it's an incredibly costly one at Shiloh. And people were looking at it and thinking, well, he got surprised the first day and he only won because he got reinforcements and they turn on him big time. But credit to Lincoln and to a lesser degree Halleck who really had his back. Many credit General Buell with taking control of the broken Union forces and leading them to victory on April 7th. Calls for General Grant's removal from command overwhelmed the White House. In response, President Lincoln replies with one of his famous quotes regarding Grant. Yep. I can't spare this man. He fights. In the South, the Battle of Shiloh proves to be a devastating loss and a complete disaster for Confederate fortunes in the Western theater. The Army of Mississippi retreats back to Corinth, Mississippi, where in the coming weeks it will be besieged by the combined armies of Grant, Buell, and Pope under overall command of General Halleck. And this is what I said about what an opportunity this was. They, they gather one of the largest armies, I think at that point the largest army that had ever been seen on the North American continent there at Corinth. And they could have just ravaged through Mississippi if they would have gone. And that was what Grant wanted to do. But Grant wasn't in charge. Halleck was. And Halleck just wouldn't move. General Albert Sidney Johnston's death at Shiloh will prove in hindsight to be another great loss to the Confederate war effort in the West, believed at the time to be the South's greatest general. His loss will deprive the Confederates of a competent and capable commanding general to lead the Western Theater's armies. Indeed, Johnson may have well been the closest thing to a Robert E. Lee in the West, and his loss will pave the way for further Confederate disasters in the Western theater, in both Maybe. campaigns and leadership. The Battle of Shiloh is a watermark moment in the early Civil War, although the battles of Manassas awakened the American people to the realities of a long war. The Battle of Shiloh truly opens their eyes to the horrors of modern industrial war. Yep. Many believed before the Battle of Shiloh that the beginning of the end was at hand. However, the Battle of Shiloh would prove to be just the end of the beginning of a long and terrible war. Yep, accurate. Good stuff. I really enjoyed that. And I'm, I'm excited at some point we'll dive into some more of their stuff, talk about some of the other battles. Uh, thank you guys, by the way, for showing your support uh, to Warhawk. I, I happened to go over and I noticed they had a big uptick, not only in subscribers, uh, but also in views. So hopefully that continues. Hopefully we can continue to shine a light on their channel and get them some support. So I appreciate that. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below and we'll see you again tomorrow with some more content. Thanks for watching.